Welcome to State of Health Podcast. This is your host, Jay Mart. On this podcast, I will share my knowledge and experience as a personal trainer and health coach and talk about my interests and experiments in physical training, nutrition, and other lifestyle factors involved in health. On this episode of the podcast, I am joined by Dr. Ryan DeBell to talk about his experience with low back pain and the lessons he's learned. Ryan earned a master's degree in sport and exercise science and a doctorate in chiropractic while attending the University of Western States. After graduating from post-secondary school, Ryan started Movement Fix, his platform designed to be a place where you can learn to become a master of your body. He's got lots of free resources that you can check out at themovementfix.com, including written articles, videos, and podcasts. Before getting into back pain, Ryan and I exchanged stories about our experiences with post-secondary education as we both have a master's degree. After that, Ryan described how his back gradually got worse due to a variety of contributing reasons, including spending a lot of time sitting in class during chiro school or getting back manipulations as part of his learning, and doing a lot of heavy CrossFit workouts with bad form. We talked about the important lessons he learned throughout his four-year journey of fixing his back, such as taking a long-term approach and understanding that there are no quick fixes that make back pain go away. We also discussed the importance of identifying and avoiding repetitive movement and how that can be taken too far. We also tackled the how and why questions of back pain. Ryan described some of the common mechanisms in the body which are responsible for sending pain signals to the brain, covering how back pain occurs. And we discussed how pain is just a message or information provided by the body to indicate that something is wrong and needs to be addressed, covering why back pain occurs. Lastly, we finished the podcast discussing the utility of loaded back flexion through the Jefferson Curl, an exercise which Ryan has been critical of in the past. We talked about the importance of context when selecting exercises for training. So if all that sounds interesting, then this podcast episode is for you. Just before we get started, this is a reminder that you can get started with my free bodyweight training program, Body Basics, which requires no equipment by going to subscribepage.com slash bodybasics. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm, hit subscribe if you like the content, and hit the notification bell too. If you're listening through a podcast app, could you please share the podcast with a friend who may also enjoy listening and discussing it with you? All right, here's the episode. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me on another episode of State of Health. I'm your host, Jay Mart, and I'm super excited for this one today because I have a special guest on the episode. Our special guest is not only the host of the Movement Fix podcast, but also the founder of T2, which is a soft tissue tool for manual therapists, and that is Ryan DeBell. Ryan, thank you for joining me on State of Health today. Jay Mart, thank you for having me on your show. I'm very excited to be here. Nice. I think that's the first time you've called me Jay Mart. <laughs> Well, you called yourself Jay Martin, and then I kind of caught it on the fly there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the nickname I go by. <laughs> I'm trying to play by the, you know, by the the um, what's the word I'm looking for? My podcast like, rules. No, I was gonna say the uh, the context. You know, it was very contextual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In the in the context of uh, the public, I like to be known as Jay Mart, and then friends and family call me John. Perfect. I like that. Mm -hmm. Good name, nickname. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to my friend Seabass who gave it to me. Seabass gave gave it J Mart. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> so uh, Ryan, I wanted to have you on the podcast today because I wanted to talk to you about back pain and because you mm -hmm. have a personal story about low back pain that Indeed. I'd love for you to share with people on who are listeners of the State of Health podcast and also some of the lessons that you learned and kind of like what you tell people about it now. And mm -hmm. then, but just before we get to that. I wanted to ask you, because I didn't know this, I noticed that you have a master of science degree as well as being a doctor of chiropractic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have a master of science degree as well. So I'm always interested in what yeah. other people's experience with this is. So before mm -hmm. we get on the back pain uh, part of the podcast, maybe would you mind giving us and the listeners uh, a brief overview like of your academic training and what exactly sure. was your master of science training focused on? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, I went, when I was in undergrad, I studied, I went to business school at the University of Washington and I studied, well, I was going to study accounting. And then 
I, I took quite a few accounting classes and I remember having my accounting textbook. It was like accounting 210 or some, you know, whatever ambi- like arbitrary name they get. And I remember it was talking about like how Apple needs to recognize their revenue to report for. And I, was, and I just remember I literally punched my book and was like, I don't care. I don't care. So then I, so I switched, I was still in business school. I switched to studying um, the management of information systems. So basically technology and business, because I, you know, I've always liked technology from a very young age and I got some internships. I actually worked at Washington mutual headquarters bank um, in Seattle, like in their corporate headquarters in 2008, when it went bankrupt and everybody lost their jobs. And I watched people in their fifties who had all of their retirement in Washington mutual stock when it went to zero. Oh God. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So, and then I had some other stuff. And then I I realized like, I just, it was like seeing that in 2008, I thought I want like a set of skills that if literally the world burned down, like I have a practical thing that people need. And so I decided to do something in health and fitness because I was also very interested in that. So I decided to go to chiropractic school um, right. instead of physical therapy school, basically only because like those are the, you know, those are the two things people always think between like chiropractor, physical therapist. Mm-hmm. And I chose chiropractic because um, I had just had had good experiences with chiropractic for chiropractors that I saw versus physical therapists. And that could be totally random because there's so many people in both professions that are like really good and also really, really bad in both. So that was just sort of a coin flip. Sure. So I did that. um, And then they offered a master's degree simultaneously. So like there's a lot of overlap between the doctorate in chiropractic and the master's in there's a master's in sport and exercise science. Okay. Um, So it was really blended together. So like, I honestly can't even really remember. I don't even know like which parts were which necessarily because I was doing it all at the same time. Um, but we did a lot of, gosh, I don't even really remember. I just remember going, I was in school all the time, like from 7.30 AM until 10 PM. I was in like the school or clinic or at an event or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know what like a standalone master's degree is like, actually. Mm-hmm. I okay. think that yeah, it's hard for me to compare, but it, um, but I, I definitely like enjoyed it. We did a lot of uh, like stuff on the field for football games, mm-hmm. like high school football games. I just remember seeing these like fourteen year old kids just getting wrecked after wrecked. Like we'd have to run on the field because someone dislocated their shoulder, and then another person mm-hmm. five minutes later had a concussion. I was like, oh my gosh, this is really dangerous sport yeah, for yeah, high yeah. schoolers. Um, but yeah, so my experience is sort of like it was so blended that I don't even really remember. Sure, sure, honest. okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. A little bit different from mine. I mine was yeah. More what was so, yours? Uh, what was yours like? It was more so working in a laboratory and doing experiments. Uh, yeah, I worked like with mice what, a lot. What, what was the master's degree in? Developmental and stem cell biology, particularly oh. with regards to kidney development. We were studying in animal models using mice and looking at a specific signaling pathway called sonic hedgehog signaling. <laughs> sonic hedgehog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in, in I believe in humans it's called sonic hedgehog, but uh, in uh, in mam- in in mice they just call it hedgehog <laughs> hedgehog signaling. Mm, um, interesting. And, yeah, and so we were just looking at how that signaling pathway helps the development of the kidney in an embryonic stage, uh, uh-huh. specifically to do with like layers of the kidney itself. I was like looking at it was very very kind of uh, focused on one particular subject. I was literally just looking at the outer layers the cell layer of the kidney, that surface. Wow. Layer. So the yeah. whole master's degree was like about one layer of the kidney. <laughs> yeah. And how, how did you like end that. up? How did you like get into doing that? That seems interesting. Like how does, how does one end up studying one layer of the kidney? Just the luck of the dry. I, I wanted to do a master of science and then uh-huh. I ended up working with a principal investigator who was an nephrologist. And then obviously mm-hmm. he's interested in kidney development and his, lab was studying the pathway, the hedgehog signaling pathway. And then as I came in, that was the project that kind of needed the most attention. What exactly, Mm -hmm. how exactly is the signaling pathway involved with the outermost layer of the kidney? 
through development. Mm. I bet you learned a lot of uh, interesting like methodologies, practi- like how practically people do research on things, I'm guessing. Yeah, definitely. Like, definitely. I, I, all the skills that I have now for like understanding the world are basically what I learned from that class in terms of like the, not so much the hands-on skills, because there's a lot uh-huh. of hands-on skills too. Like I learned how to uh, do dissections on mice. Like, so mm. uh, like I learned those skills, but then the more important skills were like the critical thinking skills where I'm like learning yeah. and looking at something and trying to understand what are the questions I can ask about this to glean a better understanding of what's truly going on. I feel like that's a really important part of higher education is learning the the skills of critically thinking, you know, and like whatever, whatever you're focused on, it's like those skills are so applicable to other things. Huh? Yeah, definitely. So is that very kind of different similar- experience, very <laughs> different that- experience for mine. I was, we, it was nothing like that for us. Like I didn't, it was so, it was much more broad. Sorry, mm-hmm. my window's open. Was that super loud? Some motorcycle. I didn't hear anything. Oh, perfect. I guess this little green tip on my microphone is. Mm-hmm catching that is that the movement fix screen well i didn't have it custom made but i did try to find the closest screen to movement fix screen <laughs> i like it so yes did, did you find the skills you got from your masters in chiropractic were similar in, in kind of like the critical thinking and trying to apply kind of or, or ask the right questions mm-hmm. to be able to um, yeah just understand things around you a little bit better well i think if anything what it gave me was just like confidence in myself and my skills Mm -hmm. like you know speaking in public about a topic is already challenging enough you know because everybody thinks they're not worthy of doing i mean you have some people who like deluded themselves to thinking they're you know like they're an expert when they're not but i think for a lot of people who are intelligent it's like very intimidating to speak publicly about topics um, at least from what I found from talking to people, it's like, Ooh, it makes you feel nervous, right? Cause you're putting your own ideas out there. You're putting your own thoughts out there. You're now opening yourself up for criticism. So I, th- I feel like at least for me, it just gave me comfort. Like, like I've tried to learn the best that I can. I'm going to share that. And mm-hmm. I just feel like it's sort of like, if you explore through some, now I'm not saying by any means that that is what is required to speak publicly about anything. Cause you can learn anything on the internet. And you can probably learn more on the internet faster than you can in a formal education program. You know, if you really, if you These focus days, enough, sure. yeah. Like if you take people's courses, if you just Google around, but obviously there's, a, you know, a ton of distractions on the internet also. Um, yeah. I just think it was part of my process of, of really questioning things to the root. But again, it was like, it wasn't quite the same. Like we didn't, we weren't doing experiments. We weren't doing that type of stuff. Um, I just learned more about like exercise physiology and like how that is academically looked at. Yep. So yeah, very different experience though. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking about feeling comfortable teaching or talking Uh about a subject that you, that you know about, let's talk about back pain a little bit. Oh, let's do it. Yeah. Uh Well, it's a pretty big topic, you know, almost everyone experiences one or more episodes of low back pain, right. During their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And like, um, for a small percentage of people, right. Some of the statistics I've looked up says that 10% of people, of people who have had back pain for them, it persists and it turns into like a chronic thing. And then of Mm -hmm. course that leads to disability, like sickness, yeah. Loss of employment. So this is something that like is pretty big. It affects people from not only working, but also doing like everyday activities. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people yeah. can relate to it. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you can give my, a brief summary of your back pain story, sure. like uh, coming, it was uh, from what I remember kind of, cause you shared this story on a different podcast, but yeah, it yeah. was coming out of Cairo school where you really kind of felt the biggest. Yeah. Yes. Of it. Yeah. So like, <clears throat> My training background through my whole life, like I played basketball, I did track, I was, I did jumping sports, like stuff like that. And then when I was in college, I started doing CrossFit um, and I didn't really know. Yeah. I just basically watched the videos on the internet and then tried to imitate it the best that I could. And I didn't really know anything about like the methodology of training. I was, I was in business school at the time. I wasn't studying this stuff formally. I didn't, you know, I didn't have the experience that I have now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just crushing workouts like 
as hard as I could. I wanted to make myself vomit, you know, like I was so in that world. Like I wanted to make my, I like tried to make myself pass out by working out so hard. Like that was like, I was like 20 and I was like, you know, if I don't pass out, I didn't push hard enough, you know, that type of, you know, mentality, no pain, which is no gain. Yeah. All that very misguided, you know? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I wasn't thinking about the volume of my training or like the technique as much. Um, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I create a lot of my own injuries and, uh, one of those <clears throat> was, you know, as we're talking about right now, obviously my lower back. And I think it was a, a combination of trying to literally push myself to the limits constantly, as well as suddenly I was sitting in class like 10 hours a day, probably sitting in the worst positions possible. You know, not that I think like there's a bad position to put a joint in, but I think there's a bad position to put a joint in a lot. Extended period so, of time. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can bend your back in all sorts of positions, right? But if you do that for 10 hours a day and then you're lifting too much. And then the other thing was getting my back manipulated in mm. chiropractic school and manipulation is a technical term for the, what people think of as a chiropractic adjustment. Basically mm -hmm. a manipulation is a quick stretching of a joint, which often makes a cracking sound because of the, mm -hmm. the fluid tension inside the okay. joint. So we're practicing that on each other all the time. Bam, 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 bam. Mm -hmm. And no joint should have that kind of exposure to that level of stretching and mm -hmm. stress. So I was sitting, I was doing workouts just as hard as I could. And I was getting my joints like stretched out forcefully by people who were in training. And I, I would tweak it here. It was, it was tight for a couple of weeks. I'd tweak it. I would tweak it. I wasn't changing my workouts. I was just being totally, I was totally lost in what I was, my approach. And it took like three, four years to oh, wow. get fully better. Yeah. And I tried, you know, tried soft tissue work, exercises, da, 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 da. I never got any imaging. I never got x-rays. I didn't want to know mm -hmm. because there's a lot of research that shows that people who get an MRI and they see a disc herniation, even though, you know, tons of people have a disc herniation with no pain. Then when your back hurts, you're like, Ooh, it's that disc herniation flaring up. And then you start associating it with, mm -hmm. so kind of, so I didn't want to know. Sure. Sure. That makes sense to me. And, um, yeah, what really changed it for me was reading Dr. McGill, Stuart McGill's book. Uh, I think that specific one I read was called low back disorders. And I literally had to read it like standing, like I was standing. <laughs> this is while I was treating patients in school. I was like in the back room between my patients, like walking around cause I couldn't sit oh, for more than five minutes without it hurting, which is common for a disc problem. Like it hurts mm -hmm. within five minutes of sitting. It's pretty kind of classically described that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I like stopped bending my back. Like I stopped flexing my lumbar spine, uh, very intentionally for like months mm -hmm. and it so, made it, it got a it got it better. It, it definitely was the thing that helped me make mm -hmm. progress to getting better. Mm -hmm. Um, but I overdid that. Yeah. And then yeah. I lost my ability to flex the spine. So it's like, you have to temp, sometimes you have to temporarily, like the lesson I learned from that is like, I had to, and I had to have a lot of faith that I was doing the right thing yeah. because it, you know, when you're dealing with a muscle and you, maybe you have a strain of the muscle. Okay. It has tons of blood supply. So it heals super fast, relatively speaking, four to six weeks. If anybody who's strained a muscle, you know, gets better pretty quick. If you tear it completely, obviously it takes longer, mm -hmm. but a disc which is, or ligaments, which is what I think, again, mm -hmm. speculative, because I think any, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like definitive diagnostic on the exact tissue, if that's even possible. Mm -hmm. um, but those tissues don't have the blood supply that a muscle has. So they just can't heal as fast. And so if you're thinking that you're going to get results in four to six weeks, uh, you're fooling yourself. Yeah, it's not because that's not how it's going to work. It's going to take longer. And so then you have to trust that you're doing the right thing without seeing the results. So I really learned how to trust something without seeing the results, which is like a major life lesson for me. Wow. That is, um, that is huge. Yeah. And I would like, like dropping a sock on the, or like dropping something on the ground was like a monumental task. Mm -hmm. Cause then it was like, you can't just bend over and pick it up. <laughs> I had like a very specific way of lunging down and bending 
It was terrible, man. It was like, it was very hard emotionally, psychologically, energetically. Yeah. You don't know what you got till it's gone, right? It made me, yeah, it really made me appreciate it. But so then what happened though is like, so I was so diligent about not flexing my spine. I became, and this is pretty common actually, uh, I became extension intolerant. Mm-hmm. So it hurt to bend my spine backwards. Wow. And my, and my thinking of, for that is because, uh, because I wasn't bending forwards, I was spending all my time loading on my facet joints. And then those essentially get like sensitive because you're load anything you, anything you load too much will become sensitive because the body, you know, it's like you, if you move a lot, you're constantly changing which tissues or whatever are under load. Right. Um, and so, so then I became extension intolerant. So there was a period of like, I don't know, a year where I was flexion and extension intolerant simultaneously. So like, I basically just couldn't move my spine. And by the way, during this time, I was like flying around the world, teaching people about movement. So it was like, there was this irony that was very hard for me. My God. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like flying, getting off the airplane being like, Ooh, I'm about to teach people about movement. Who am I to teach people about movement? My back hurts all the time. But Mm. I know I'm doing the right thing. And Mm. I know I didn't know when I got hurt. It's like there was some of that psychological stuff of like I had to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I was right. After like after everything, I was right because now my back feels great. I don't have any back pain at all. And I'm recovering my lumbar flexion more now than ever. I started doing yoga like a year ago. Which I don't know if you're familiar with yoga, but I'm learning a ton because it's something I'm I'm like. There's like directions I have never moved my body. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gaining a, a, a tremendous respect for yoga, and I. F- it's a beautiful art. Yeah, it's incredible what it what it you know what it's really trying to do. Part of it is the physical, you know, being able to basically like fold your body. Like if you think about strength training, you're basically trying to move your joints in a very particular way. Mm-hmm uh, heavy, a lot or fast, or some combination of those three. Yeah. And in yoga, you're like, you're trying to use the minimum force required and you're trying Mm -hmm. to relax everything. Mm -hmm. So people are critical of yoga in the strength and conditioning world. And I think that's, I think that is, I think that's a huge mistake that people are making considering that I think it's short-sighted. And I think that it's people thinking you can one is good and one is bad, which is totally ridiculous. It's easy to critique, right? Like you can point point out something wrong in something and be like, oh, look at that. It's yeah, I could no point at a like, million. Yeah. I, I could point at a million things wrong with strength and conditioning training that people are doing. Like mm-hmm. people are out of their minds doing certain things. Exactly. We're using the body in a very strange way with strength and conditioning. Like it is not natural to like not bend your spine when you pick something up, but we want to get stronger. So we have to do that. So there's like a lot of little things that we're tweaking around. Uh, It's a whole other topic, but so, so then I had to regain my lumbar flexion, which was a painful process. I had a lot of nerve tension I had to work through, which is something you have to go very, very slowly, very Mm. slowly through nerve tension. So regaining that lumbar flexion and lateral flexion, the ability to stabilize inflexion. Mm -hmm. So something like, you know, basically a lot of abdominal strength. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that happens too, when you lose your lumbar flexion is, um, you, you really start to, you can really start depending on the person, you can really start pinching your hip joints Uh, and then you can really end up with some anterior hip impingement. Now, I think that we are going to see in the future, a lot of people who do classic strength and conditioning, get hip replacements. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that the reason for that is because we're holding the lumbar spine rigid, Mm -hmm. not letting the pelvis rotate, and -hmm. then trying to take the hip joint to its very, very end range. And we're living in this fantasy world that, um, there's no consequence to heavily loading the hip joint at end range without rotating the pelvis. Mm -hmm. So I actually think that because of that experience, I, if I squat with weight, I, and I'm trying to not bend my spine. Mm-hmm. I don't think I want to take my hip to the very end range. I try to stop short mm-hmm. because I think, I think over time people are going to pinch, 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 irritate, irritate, irritate. Not good. Mm-hmm. You know, where does that go in 30 years? Mm-hmm. So, um, like anyways, it's a process. 
<laughs> and it requires patience and it will like it literally like destroyed me so I could like be rebuilt more intelligently, more calm, more patient, more compassionate, you know, yeah. a lot of things that are beyond just physical. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, it sounds like there is a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from from that experience. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of lessons. And a lot of people go through it. You know, it's like one of the most common areas to have problems. And I don't think I don't think most people really understand, myself included. I'm still always like when it comes to the human body, I'm like, I'm always I always feel ignorant. <laughs> You know, like there's so much I don't it's so it's so weird. Like, I don't know what happens, for example, if you do certain things for 10 years, like how does the body really adapt? I mean, there's no studies that people do where it's like, okay, if we do these stretches, do we anatomically change the structure of a joint? For example, I don't know. These are hard questions. Um, Yeah. People have shoulder pain for 20 years and they do basic strength training exercises and they feel like they can't believe how much better their their body feels. Mm -hmm. People have degenerative disc stuff on an x-ray, but they have no pain. Mm-hmm. Other people have it. So there's so much. The, the more you learn. Is, yeah. The more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know. More questions you have, right? <laughs> you have more questions. I think you have more humility. I mm-hmm. think you're more realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, You've maybe learned to listen more, right? So one of the, one of the lessons that I kind of picked up on when, when you were talking is kind of just like, when your body was sending you some warning signals, you were ignoring them. <laughs> right? You I was not you could, have done a, you could have done a better job kind of uh, paying attention to what exactly is going on within you. I think if I were treating, if I were, if I were me now and me at 25, when I was like in the midst of all of this came to me, I think I could shave off two and a half years. I think instead of taking four years, it could have taken me one. Yeah, yeah. One and a half mm-hmm. to fully regain the range of motion and everything. Cause I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. I mean, even and one most and people, sorry, most, to cut you off. Oh no, no, no. Sorry. Um, and I think most, I asked Dr. McGillis cause I had him on my podcast. I was like, do you think most people just are thinking on the wrong time frame mm-hmm. when it comes to low back stuff? Um, you know, cause you have to do the right thing for long enough. And so I think what happened, and he said, you know, he, he, he agreed that, that he thinks that that happens. It's like you do the right things for six weeks, but it's a, it's a process that takes six months. So you give up and then you try something else. And then, mm-hmm. so you're, you're, you're like missing it. Mm-hmm. You're missing it due to the time, due to the time scale. Yeah. Um, but, and I, and I think that most people are like, you know, unfortunately, I think most clinicians are very, you know, like they're limited by insurance and by people the patient mm. wanting results in two months. And it's like, look, I mean, I had, a, I've had a lot of patients where I was like, this will get better, but I, I honestly think it's going to take a year. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to see you twice a week for a year. Let's not kid ourselves. It's going to do nothing for you because how can I speed up the tissue healing time? Mm-hmm. You need to learn what to do and then do it for a long time. We'll check in, mm-hmm. you know, but I don't think that approach is taken very much. I, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it's tough to have that long-term multi-year approach, you know, of like coming to the realization that there are no quick fixes, no one magical yeah. single exercise or one magical single stretch. <laughs> that's going to make all the pain go away. That's just not a thing. Yeah. There's no five exercises to like, despite what you see in your Instagram explore tab, there are no three best exercises for low back pain. That's absurd. It's absurd. Mm-hmm. How, and, how could that possibly be the case? Or the other one is uh, back pain gone in 30 seconds. Yeah. Maybe for somebody, you know, for somebody, yes. For other, for other people, absolutely. No, it's not, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's why I think like principles of, of rehab and strength training are the most important thing to understand. Now, what would you say though? Like, of course it's easy to say, take the long-term approach, but then you have people who have jobs where they're like living is dependent on, you know, having a hard manual labor job where they have to kind of load their back in some way to earn a living. Is it just yep. a matter of uh, finding a way to take time off and having a different source of income or what, mm. what can you do for those people? Yeah. I mean, that, I definitely saw that also like certain people is like the demand, like they're climbing up trees and cutting branches and it's like, <laughs> they have hip pain. Like 
I think that's one of those, that's part of the art of being a, somebody who works with people in pain mm-hmm. is really understanding what somebody's doing in their job. Mm-hmm. And then using your understanding of the human body as best you can to find solutions to that. Mm-hmm. I, so one, one good example is this guy who he had back pain and he was a plumber. Mm. So, I mean, what would you, what do you, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but that's fine. someone says I'm a plumber, my back hurts. Like, what are your initial thoughts with that? I'm curious. I'm a plumber. I'm back hurts. That's probably because you're bending over a whole bunch throughout the day. Exactly. Today. <laughs> that's what I thought, but he was a commercial plumber uh-huh. and commercial plumbers. As I learned, because I asked him, they work in the ceiling on a ladder. Uh they work on the floor below, at least this guy, uh-huh. he worked on the floor below on a ladder overhead. So he was bending backwards too much. Uh-huh. You see, it's like, yeah, this is part of like, I made the same assumption. Out, and then he told me that I was like, oh God, how mm-hmm. important is it to be like, wait, wait, wait. Mm-hmm. So tell me what positions you're in mm-hmm. when you're at work. So I understand. And he was like, well, I'm always overhead. I was like, you're a plumber. What are you talking about? You're overhead. You know, <laughs> so imagine if I just made that assumption and I was like, okay, yeah. well, you have to, you need to like do these back bends and not, no, he needed to flex more. He needed to like strengthen his abs and learn how to, you know, stabilize his lumbars and bend through his hips or through his thoracic spine and distribute those uh, joint ranges through other segments to, you know, not have a higher stressed area. So part, of, so part of the job of being a healthcare provider is kind of being like a detective and figuring out what yeah. this person's doing. It's the and, ultimate problem solving. It's yeah, the I, ultimate diagnostic. You know, it's like if you had a computer that had a problem, you have certain diagnostic things, but you have to understand how to, like you could learn these basic protocols to analyze a computer, but you need to understand fundamentally how a computer works mm-hmm. so that you're like, Ooh, I think this is the problem. And that's why you can't memorize stuff with the human body. People try to memorize. No, you need to understand it. Yeah. You need to understand how it works. You need to understand mm-hmm. how physic, you know, physics mm-hmm. and the emotional components, the psychological components, the physical components. Mm-hmm. Um, so, cause once you can, once you really develop an understanding, uh, then, you know, you can listen to somebody and have really Mm-hmm. you're not like, Ooh, I think that's this thing. You're like, you, you look at it from a pure point of view, at, at least the most pure that you can. And it's like, ah, mm-hmm. well, my best guess, because a, a diagnosis of anything is a best guess, sure. <laughs> especially, mm-hmm. especially when you, when you think about manual medicine, you know, like pain that does not show up on an image, like, yeah. Okay. Somebody has a tumor. You can see that. But somebody has pain and it's like, well, the x-rays are nothing, no, nothing on an MRI, but you have pain. Mm. Well, then you have what to you really, do? you have to really think and make your best guess. And then you, you take actions based on your best guess of what to do for that person. Uh, and this is where the time scale thing is hard because like, mm-hmm. if it's back pain and you're like, well, I think it's this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think the time frame is a year. What if you're wrong and it wasn't, you know? Mm. Then it's like, how do you keep going for a year? How, if you're at month six, like I've seen people where it's like month six, they don't feel better yet. Month eight, they just poof, suddenly they feel so much better. Wow. Like, can you imagine advising someone for six? No, keep doing it. Keep doing it. It yeah. hasn't been long enough. You That's have that. to really believe in what you're saying. And, That's- but also be open to the fact that you could be wrong. You have to be willing to be wrong. But I mean, I saw plenty of people like that where they'd gone somewhere for two, three months. They were doing all sorts of different, you know, constantly changing what they were doing. I was like, I think this is going to take six months of doing the same thing. Mm. Yeah. And I I wasn't right every time. Of course, nobody is. But there were a lot Mm. of people that I saw them at month six, didn't feel good. Month seven, didn't feel good. Month eight, they were like, oh, it's really starting to feel better now. Okay. Now we can start doing some different things. Yeah, I guess part of that is also just like managing their expectations throughout the whole process, right? Even from day one, when someone comes to you and is looking for some, uh, you know, advice or a consultation or whatever, you have to right away manage their expectations, give them this timeline that you're thinking of. And then on top of that, find out, are there any like 
red flags going on with them kind of mentally because you said right the biopsychosocial model that psycho social component is very important like sometimes people have this idea in their mind where all back pain is harmful and disabling and more pain equals more tissue damage so i better not move or another thing is like yeah Yeah. it's just like they might be just like isolated not around people and that's going to contribute to back pain too i'm sure just like having a belief that like nothing's going to help or like only like some passive treatments of somebody else working on me rather than me actively like paying attention to this and doing some whatever it is that you have to actively do it's just having all these mental kind of roadblocks you have to in addition to setting the timeline get get rid of those as well yeah because you know somebody who's not social for example it's like they maybe their pain is the same but they suffer more Mm -hmm. you know like and because they don't have social interaction, they're a little bit more depre- depressed. So then their morale is down. And then now they're thinking negative thoughts all the time. It's yeah. like, that's a huge component to it. Um, yeah. You have to take all these things into consideration. That's, I mean, that's the art of it and the science, like the science and the art, you have to really understand these things. And I mean, you have to sort of be the light for people. <laughs> like you have to be a source of energy for people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because people come to you with, pro- you know, people are coming to you with pain and problems, and you have to be able to uplift. That's part of the job is uplifting people. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, back pain. I mean, yeah, and you got to strip tricky, it down tricky, and tricky. start from the base, right? Like, get rid of all the weight, almost like right, unload everything. Yeah, and, you gotta- and just start from the most basic movements. Like, what can you do? where the pain is not like 10 out of 10 <laughs> and, and go from, yeah, there. you know, it's easy to get sort of pushed into a corner, right? Like suddenly you have, you have less and less and less options of doing things. And so it's important working with somebody is instead of, instead of like, just like, you have to be realistic. There are certain things that probably are not going to be good for that person, mm-hmm. but there are other things. And this is, that's why I feel like most people go wrong there. It's like, tell people what they can't do. Well, Mm. you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this. Don't do this. Avoid this. Mm. What about telling people all the things they can do? Because I guarantee you there's more things they can do than things they can't do. However, in, you know, any sort of medical profession, alternative or whatever, I hate calling, I hate calling what I do alternative. Like I hate calling, you know, the, the promotion of exercise movement, and like a generally healthy lifestyle, to me, that's primary. Sure, me too. The, the primary is being healthy. The alternative to being healthy is taking a pharmaceutical drug. That's the alternative. We call that mm-hmm. primary, you know, in a lot of instances. I think that's backwards. I think we're confused. The yep. primary thing we should be doing for people is promoting their health. And then, mm-hmm. you know, as a backup, we have these other things. Mm-hmm. I need to be focusing on the things that people can do mm-hmm. and helping people gain territory. Mm. Like it's like gaining, you need to gain movement territory. Mm -hmm. You're trying to go, your back hurts and you're trying to immediately get back to deadlifting 225 or 315 or whatever the weight is. Mm. I think you're totally thinking in the wrong way. Mm. What is your realistic territory that you don't have problems in? Spend some time training there and then slowly gain territory Mm. and, and, Get as much of the territory as you can, but be patient and don't try to jump back where you were. Psychologically, people think they're the same anatomically, physiologically, neurologically. They're not, Mm. you can't, you're not like, oh, I feel good now. Let me jump back to where I was. Uh, That's a big mistake. Let yourself just gradually go back into it. I mm-hmm. tried to so many times I tried to jump back in, jump back in. No, mm-hmm. no, mm-hmm. I would not advise myself to do that. Mm-hmm. I would advise myself to go way slower. It's like slower is faster because you have less hiccups. <laughs> um, yeah. I say slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. Yeah. It's like a Navy seal thing. isn't it? Uh, yeah. I've heard it from somebody else. It's not my thing. <laughs> you didn't invent that. I know. Um, Just a copy of other people's uh, one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so unloading and like one thing that I thought of was like when you to unload the spine and kind of find move. Well, first of all, 
let me tell you this, like I have a similar mental model to what you're talking about, where my mental uh-huh. model is trying to have a body map. I have this. So similar to the territory movement territory you're talking about, my mental model is a map of the body. It's this mental map of my body where mm. I, through my mind, can feel that part of my body. I can feel whatever mm. sensations are going on in that part, whether I'm moving or not, so particularly when I'm moving, that's the more important one. But uh, you can like, I think of it, there's, there's certain parts of my mental, uh, of my map of my, like my hands, I have like, I can zoom in, you know, when you can zoom into street view, you can see everything basically, right? I have that capability for my hands. I can do pretty much anything with my hands, but other parts of my body. Maybe wait, wait, my so back, wait, wait, what is it? What is that? Like, tell me more about like zooming in. What do you like? What is that like for you? What do you, how are you experiencing that? Just the ability to control the movement to be as precise as I can think it to be, even with like my eyes closed or whatever, you know, I can like touch different parts of my fingers, parts of my hand and, Uh and make that movement happen with like, with quite a high level of precision, that level of precision Uh could be something that you, uh, develop over time for all sorts of parts, all the different parts of your body, especially I think of it for your spine, because that's mm. part, of, part of the body that has all this ability to move. You know, we've got 24 joints over there, if not more, right? And um, at, at least the verte- vertebra, the, the joint number is higher. Well, I, don't, I, I would have to like, I would have yeah. to like think about what that number is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, <laughs> but <laughs> how to like count? In any way, in any, in any uh-huh. case, we can develop our ability, our mental map of how to move that part of our body more, more finely, more finely over time. Right now, at least when I started like paying attention to my spine, I could easily make these global movements of spinal flexion and spinal extension. Mm -hmm. But you can think of that as like this overlooking kind of look of the map where you can just kind of see the continents, but you can't really zoom in to see the different cities and different you know, neighborhoods, let's say in a map, whereas as you develop that idea, that, that proficiency of movement, you start uh, controlling the spine through those individual vertebra and you build up back resiliency that can basically give you this ability to have body awareness where you can really understand and interpret your body position very precisely. And then Mm -hmm. through that, you can be more refined with movement and more refined and precise movement turns into more smooth and comfortable movement over time. I love that. Did you, I'm curious. um, So I, with this like like territory thing, the way I, I used to play a lot of Starcraft when I was growing up. Like, I don't know if you ever played that game. Um, I played like map games before I played, I played like uh, SimCity. I played uh, uh, Civilization. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like the way you describe it is like a Sim City way where you're like zooming into the and the, mine's like the map is dark until you go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like building a more it's like building a higher level of body consciousness in a way like Exactly, yeah. Like you're developing your homunculus. Mhm. Is like that the, is that the part the, of the brain that does that? The, well, it's like a mental representation of um mm. if you if you google the word homunculus, you'll see it's like a person, but the size of each body part is like the size oh, okay. of like the actual area of the brain. It's like the fingers and the lips are way bigger because they have more uh, representation in the brain areas. So it's like a ref- uh. it like reframes the person as the size of the neural sensitivity, I guess would be the a way you could describe it. Like they yeah, have yeah, huge yeah. fingers and huge mm-hmm. lips, like tiny torso. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're, so you're like, you're like building your homunculus out in a way. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a, yeah, I'm, I'm going to look that up. You know what, <laughs> you know, it's interesting too. Like, as you say that, like, I think people learn how to move sometimes in a painful way and they don't know how to move in a non-painful way. Hmm. Like, cause you know, like somebody has like shoulder pain and like, Ooh, you know, it hurts when I do this. Mm-hmm. And like, they get really good at moving it in the way that hurts. And like, they don't realize that there's ways to move it where it doesn't hurt. Mm-hmm. Super interesting. I kind of like when you were describing that, it made me think of that. Like you can, you do need, sometimes you need to learn how to move it in a way that doesn't hurt. Like you're yeah. just moving it in the way that hurts because you've practiced it so much, you know, mm-hmm. like you need to like learn the other ways of moving it smoothly as you describe pain-free. 
Now, the beauty of movement, there's an infinite number of variations that you can move through in terms of like joint uh, angles and, and such. So there's and like the way the muscles are contracting. Like that's something I learned from doing yoga is like um, a lot of times I was exerting way more force. Mm-hmm. And I, and then the instructor says essentially like, see how use as little muscle as possible to hold this position. And I, and it makes me think like, man, you know, we probably pull the joint way harder than we need to in certain ways that we don't even realize that we're doing. Mm-hmm. Like if you raise your arm up to the side, like I've always been interested, like if you took a bunch of people and you measured, you could measure like the percent of each of the muscles for that person, how they move. Like people are probably using, like, if you, if we keep talking about the shoulder, people Mm -hmm. are probably using different percentages globally to move these joints. And I bet you can train yourself to change those percentages, you know? Yeah. Like maybe, maybe you're raising your arm up to the side and it's like, you're using your deltoid 50% and your infraspinatus 20%, but someone else is using it 40, 30, like, you know, yeah, yeah. like 100%. that's going to change the way the joint moves because it's going to be pulled differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So probably too, when you're doing like what you're describing of like learning these different ways or like what yoga has done for me is like train me how to move with less force mm. instead of always trying to move with more force. Yeah. Like, why are we so focused on always moving with the most force? More is better. (laughs) Yeah. More has to be better. You know, like I think even too, when we talk about like strength and conditioning, we treat the body, like the body, the ultimate goal of the human body is to be able to do as much physical work as possible. You know, is that really the thing to optimize for? Mm. Well, that's subjective. (laughs) Right. I mean, it depends what somebody wants, right? Mm -hmm. I think people want to be healthy, but then they train the body to do as much work as possible. Yeah. Uh, And I don't, and I don't think that those, I don't think the things you would do for those two goals are the same. (laughs) No, it's funny. You say that actually, that made me think of something that a friend of mine just recently told me he was, uh, he was working out doing squats, barbell back squats, I think, and kind of hurt his back a little bit and has been taking time off. And it's just funny because he's like, every time I try to be healthy, I hurt myself. Feel like something's telling me, uh, you know, like uh, right. your actions and your goals are not aligned, basically. Mm-hmm. Right? Because, yeah. like, what is what is it? How how does does having a heavier back squat make you healthier? Like, that's a you know, that's a question that's hard to swallow when it's deeply ingrained in you that the holy grail of exercise is a back squat. Like, does yeah. that objectively make you healthier? Like, if you squat two twenty five, someone else squats three fifteen, are they healthier? You know, and this is coming from someone who did CrossFit for 10 years, like where the goal is to increase work capacity. Mm. But why am I increasing work? capacity? Why do I think that increased work capacity is better for me? Yeah. Like maybe more optionality is better actually, right? Like mm-hmm. maybe, maybe instead of trying, maybe the effort I'm putting into trying to increase my work capacity, uh, if I put that into building more optionality, mm. uh, and cause you know, we have a limited amount of time and energy to do things with our bodies every day. It's like, what are you sacrificing by optimizing for increased work capacity? Yeah. Well, you're, you know, you have less time for skill. You have less time to relax your body. You have less time to map out. Like you described all these different mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like, what are we, what are we really trying to do here for someone who's a competitor or an athlete? Of course, they're trying to maximize their power and their speed and their skill mm-hmm. and all that. Mm-hmm. But for somebody like me, I don't know what, I don't know what your training goals are, but for me, I want to be healthy and functional for as long as possible. Mm-hmm. So pushing myself to the limit, I don't think is the way to do that. Yeah. That's kind yeah. Of, that was hard for me to come to terms with, right? Because there's so much, um, cognitive dissonance when you've been doing something for so long and then you realize why the hell was I doing that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, but, my, uh, my training goal is to be a gold medalist at the hundred year old Olympics. 100 year old olympics <laughs> like a like a in the decathlon or what <laughs> I, there's probably going to be a couple gold medals <laughs> nice. yeah like lo- like if we think about longevity of physical abilities should does it make sense to push ourselves as hard as possible mm-hmm. and i don't think those are the same thing you know? no 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 you want to you want to last a long time. So you have to build up your capacity 
over a very, very slow or long period of time, nice and slow. And that's, that's kind of like the approach I'm taking is I have basically the rest of my life to keep working out, to keep getting stronger, faster, more flexible, have better endurance. And, exactly. and so why, why kill myself? <laughs> it doesn't make it. Yeah. I don't, it's not, that's something I would have told myself. And I don't think my younger <laughs> self would have believed me. I think it'd have been like, you're lazy. You're yeah. lazy. That's what I would have. I probably would have been like, it is a tough yeah. balance though. Right. Like you're right. Because then right, you, you don't want to be lazy and you, you get, you get, you do get lazy if you don't push yourself hard enough sometimes. Right. So, but, but I think what, I, and I think kind of what we're getting to, at least what I'm trying to maybe communicate here is that pushing yourself doesn't mean exhausting yourself mm. because I can push myself in a yoga class to try to relax more. That takes mm. effort. Like, <laughs> or like I push myself, like sometimes like, like if I'm doing running training, I have to, I have to push myself by not running as fast. So yeah. part of it is like to run longer, I have to run slower, mm. you know, and like yeah. to train better over a longer period of time, I sometimes have to do a little bit less mm -hmm. now yeah. for a lot of people, they're not training nearly enough. So like, mm -hmm. I don't want someone to listen to this and be like, I need to train less. It's like, well, you don't do anything first <laughs> right now. So you need to start doing, <laughs> you know, but like compared to like a CrossFit games athlete, I'm, you know, I'm like pretty pathetic in my in my but i don't care because it's not my goal now so like you you really start to think about your body in terms of like dude what's going to be good in 50 years yeah part of it is also just like what i was saying earlier is just understanding your body right having that really good uh in-depth map of how your body works and how it moves and then once you have that really good understanding of yourself then you know what are the limits you can push yourself up to and where you need to back off it's a lot of it is yeah. just paying, like paying attention to who you are where, and where you need to go and then making that right kind of plan to get there rather than just thinking like what we were saying before, more is better. So let me just do more strength training, more this, more that. Yeah. And I think also too, one, one thing that I hadn't really explored until recently was how much do I really need to push myself to make progress? Mm. You know, like <clears throat> I learned this when I was doing like running training. I was talking uh, with, I did a podcast with Jay DeSherry. If, uh, if you're not familiar with him, he's, if you want to know about running, you should talk to Jay. He made this cool thing called a MOBO board. And he's written several books about uh, running. And so one of the things was doing these aerobic runs at like 60 or 70%, which for me ended up was, would be like a heart rate of like 130 to 140. And before when I was doing these aerobic runs, which is basically 20 minutes or longer, um, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't monitoring my heart rate. Then I got an Apple watch, which I think is like, I was so hesitant to get one. And then I got one and I'm like, I love it. I thought it would be annoying, you know, like, oh, I'm tracking my workouts. It's so unnatural, Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I love it. Like it's actually lowered my resting heart rate since I've had it because like I'm monitoring it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what doesn't anyways, get measured every, doesn't get managed, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, Peter Drucker. There. Peter Drucker quote, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, exactly. Sorry. So, um, and I so I I ran and I was monitoring my heart rate and I was I was like running twenty minutes at one hundred and sixty, or like one hundred and seventy, and I was supposed to be running at one hundred and thirty to one hundred and forty, and so so I so I slowed it down and I realized, oh, this this is totally a different feel. And I don't feel crushed after my, my runs. Like I was just getting crushed, but I had trained so long in my life feeling like crushed was normal. And I dialed it way back. And I, my energy throughout the day is way higher. I, I, I feel like my emotional levels and my energetic and all that stuff is way higher because I'm not pushing it. And I also think that the pushing it harder wasn't giving me more benefit mm -hmm. like physically. Mm -hmm. I actually improved my running by running slower and pacing better. So then it made me think like, I'm, I'm probably doing this all over the place and I'm not realizing it. So I, I felt like I needed to crush myself in a workout for it to be a beneficial workout. Whereas now I feel like I could not even get close to like a hundred percent effort 
Like we have this assumption that we have to give a hundred percent effort in a workout to get benefit. Mm. Like if you're not giving it your all in the workout, you're not, it's not benefiting you. I mean, I'm assuming people have that assumption yeah, and maybe they don't even realize they have that assumption. Like I didn't realize that I had that assumption. So now it's, it's more like, okay, if I consistently do my training and just do it well, instead of putting a hundred percent of my effort into it, I give it a hundred percent of my focus. That's what I, but I don't. Say. So there's a big difference between, I don't do when I'm training, I am a hundred percent in what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I give it a hundred percent focus, but I don't push myself to a hundred percent effort. Mm-hmm. I think that if I was competing, that's when I would do that, but yeah. I'm not competing. And I don't care about competing in anything other than my own ability to show up for the things that I say I'm going to do. Like that's more of mm-hmm. what I'm competing internally. Mm-hmm. Focus on so, attention over intensity and effort. You're right. Yeah, exactly. That's a great, is that, that's your one liner. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, one. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. That's the challenge is like the sustainability of your training. I mean, mm-hmm. I've pushed myself to the breaking point now in multiple ways, and I'm not going to do that to myself anymore. It doesn't lead you. It, le- it didn't lead me to where I wanted to go mm-hmm. pushing hundred percent in the workouts. <laughs> didn't do it. So my methodology and my approach was messed up. I'm in the process of figuring that out. And part of that is not pushing myself so hard in the workout, but being very focused on what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. It's like, let's talk before we we're kind of running out of time here. But maybe yeah, we'll just I, don't finish. Have, I don't have a, we can keep going until it's natural if you want. Sure, sure, sure. I just wanted to ask maybe like, how, how does back pain happen? Like, what is, what is the mechanism? <laughs> like, what are the common mechanisms? Like, so like, uh, is there a common pathway? Like oftentimes, uh, when I speak to medical doctors, they'll say back pain is a mechanical problem. So what, what is the mechanism that creates back pain? Can, can you answer well, that? Or am I putting you on the yeah, spot I'll, I'll try much? my best to answer it. Mm-hmm. I think there, you know, there's first there, I think there's many different reasons that people have pain and and you know that this kind of gets into a pain like pain sciencey type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So there's no such thing as pain. Nerve. There's no ner- There's no nerve that creates pain. Pain is an experience that the that the human mind interprets. Because like if you touch a hot surface, it hurts, but there was no damage. So the pain was just telling you of potential damage. Mm. It's a message. Now, it's a message. Hey, this is potentially damaging. Now you could also burn yourself and have pain and it's because you damaged something, you know? So <laughs> you could have low back pain because you're, you're getting a warning of potential overstressing. So one could say that pain is a communication interpretation mechanism to tell you when something is getting overstressed. Mm-hmm. Okay. So some, somehow the accumulation of stress is a mechanism. So it's not just tissue stress. You could have like, if your nervous system and your, in your thinking and your emotions are stressed, then Mm. physical stress could push you over the limit of stress and then create pain. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, nerves that fire together, wire together. Right. And if you like think of pain you, you kind of fire the same parts of your brain as when you like experience physical pain. So you can kind of, uh, experience it the same way. If it's emotional. Is that true? I think that, I think that the, the, the nerves and that fire together, wire together would be, for example, if I move my arm a certain way, mm-hmm. then the firing of that is a, like, that is associated with pain. That positional thing is associated with pain. Okay. As far as like the psychological or emotion component, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly on that. So mm-hmm. I don't, um, but what I mean is like, imagine you had a cup and if you pour water into that cup and it starts to overflow, that's when you have a painful experience. Mm-hmm. Now I could pour some emotional water in there. I could pour some tissue stress water in there. Mm-hmm. I could pour some negative thinking water in there. Mm-hmm. So if you if you, if you pour it in a bunch of emotional water, it doesn't take as much 
physical stress water for it to overflow. So therefore you could do less physical stress, but you have more emotional stress. You overflow, you have pain. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have no emotional pain, you're a Buddha and you're Zen, you could probably in that, you know, the way I'm describing it, at least, um, you could have more tissue stress without pain because you didn't have emotional water in there. So like people will do a workout, like with a lot of deadlifts, they'll get back pain. And then sometimes it'll be gone, like in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's because they just were pushing to a point where they got a painful response. Mm -hmm. Like, cause it was like touching something hot. Mm -hmm. You touched the stimulus of woo, mm -hmm. slow down. Mm -hmm. Um, but all so, so there's that component. Now, mm -hmm. if for example, you tear a disc, you can release chemical, uh, like certain chemicals that inflammatory out, substances, inflammatory things that touch the nerves mm -hmm. and then boom, you have shooting pain. Yeah. You have a chemical stimulated pain. Mm. That's like, you're not going to go, that's not, that's not going to go away by just like hoping and thinking and understanding pain is in your brain. Like you are chemically, mm. you are like putting acid on the nerve root. Mm -hmm. So you could have pain for that. Mm. Like you can have pain from literally physically damaging something. You can have pain from just stressing it. You can have pain because you're overstressed. And then you did a little bit of physical stress. You could have pain because you're loading certain joints too much. And there's, and they're starting to tell you, Hey, you're, we're basically like, like my, one of my theories is that like when you have chronic pain in an area, um, you're, you're sort of like, you're either associating a painful history. And this kind of is going with your, you know, what you said about the wiring firing together. Like if I load this joint, this direction or this way, and I've had a history of pain with doing that, I could have mm -hmm. a pain just as a conditioned response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I also think that that can happen too, though. Like if you're stressing it faster than it can recover, mm -hmm. that's like a sign. The pain is like your body being like, Hey, you need to not do this. Cause I need to recover. Mm -hmm. You need yeah. to stop doing this for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. And, there, and there can be, you know, a lot of other reasons for pain, but basically I think of it as tissue damage or tissue stress accumulate with the other accumulated stresses. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like, um, there's kind of like the how question of like, how does back pain happen? All these tissue stresses and things. And then there's like the, why does back pain happen? I think you kind of answer that is it's your body's way of communicating with you that, you know, something is off of the balance. Homeostasis mm. is, uh, you know, take is not, not quite there right now. So we need to change something to get back to balance. That's it's just this yeah. way of and sort information. Of the, yeah. Sorry. And, and part of the how too is like, every physical object in the universe has an amount of force that it can withstand before it breaks, mm -hmm. including your, your, you know, your, your physical body. Mm -hmm. And so if you do more load and volume of stress on a part of your body, that's abnormally higher than what you would normally do, mm -hmm. then you can overcome the tolerance of that tissue. Mm -hmm. So a big, you know, someone doesn't run for two years and then they go mm -hmm. run for 30 minutes. Well, I mean, you just had a s massive spike in the stress of all the tissues that get loaded with running. And then you wonder why it hurts. Well, of course it hurts. You just did, you just did way more than usual versus if you did five minutes and then seven minutes and then 10 minutes and then 12, mm -hmm. like you're just gradually building up the tolerance of the tissue. So Tim Gabbett is a guy um, that talks a lot about chronic versus acute workload. Mm -hmm. And basically what his research shows is that like, um, one of the biggest predictors of injury is just doing too much too quickly without building a base of mm -hmm. tissue tolerance and also like neurologic tolerance, emotional mm -hmm. tolerance as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think he, I don't know if he talks about that, but I think that goes along with it. Yeah. So like back pain, you haven't gone to the gym, you start lifting, you haven't lifted in a while. It's very easy to overdo it. I didn't lift for a while. I went and did some deadlifts. I tweaked myself out and I was like, Oh, too much too soon. Ryan, you know, better than this. What are mm. you doing? Yeah. It's Cause it's yeah. easy to do it. You just, you think that you can do it cause you used to do it. It's, and so it's tempting. been a while. Gyms were, 
Yeah. And you know, gyms were closed for a while. So it's easy to hop back in, think you're going to crank some weights and it's easy to overdo it because mm -hmm. you have this new spike in the total workload that you're doing or putting on those tissues. You haven't done it in a while. They're not used to it. Mm. Uh, programming is, I mean, intelligent programming is extremely mm. important. And we used to not as, as human beings, we used to not need to do that. Right. Because we had actually do physical work to survive. Mm -hmm. Now we don't. So now mm -hmm. we need to purposefully do it intelligently. So yeah. that's where programming, intelligent programming is extremely important now, because otherwise we literally don't have to do anything. You could lay in your bed all day, work from your computer and have somebody bring you food and like probably pay someone to put it in your mouth for you now. <laughs> so that means we have to intentionally exercise, which means we need to understand exercise and we need to understand what good programming is, how to not overdo mm -hmm. it, what to do, what not to do. Da, 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 da. Yep. Yep. So we have to be smarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I always say is like, think of uh, load as a tool, think of weight as a tool and as tool tools are amoral, they don't have good or bad intentions. They just have a good or a bad purpose. So use it, use the load correctly. Yeah. Like you could use a barbell and like smash it into your head. <laughs> That's nothing to do with the barbell, you know, like <laughs> I could poke myself in the eye with my finger. I could also type on a keyboard. It's the same finger. <laughs> like everything is how you use it. Right. Like that's why mm -hmm. it's like, someone's like, Ooh, this type of lift is better than this type of lift. And it's more like, those are sort of just like ways of loading things. Mm -hmm. Context is key. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, context is key. Is that, is that, did you make it, that one up? Yeah. I just thought of it on this, on the spot. So that's two, <laughs> two now I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a book by the end of this uh, podcast. Ooh, I'll buy the first one to buy it. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, one final question. And okay. this, this kind of, uh, I think perfectly, um, uh, matches well with what we were just talking about with context. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to, I couldn't have you on my podcast without asking you about the Jefferson curl. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh. Just wanted to ask you about any updates that you have on your thoughts about this exercise. And I'll just give a brief description of what the exercise is before we kind of ta start talking mm -hmm. about it. Okay. Basically a Jefferson, Jefferson curl is like when you're standing, let's say on a box or a bench and you have a little bit of load. Well, at least I'll say you, you have a little bit of load in your, in your hands and then you slowly flex the entire spine. You try to move like one vertebrae at a time from the neck down to the hips until the weights go down basically as low as they can go without bending the knees. And then you slowly reverse the motion back to standing position. And so you've been critical of this exercise and previously, and then I just want to kind of know if you, how, what are your thoughts? Cause oftentimes we update our, our thinking and, and so it, what, what would you say? Mm. I think first I, I appreciate the question because a, a person who is seeking the truth should update their opinion based on more experience, more understanding, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I, during yoga training, I do a lot of forward bends in, in the most relaxed, you know, position. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's made my body feel tremendously better. Mm. I don't do, and I haven't spent much time at all doing Jefferson curls personally. I think for me, it's more appropriate that I gain the unloaded range of motion gen as gently as possible. That's the approach that I'm taking. Mm -hmm. I think if somebody has full pain-free range of motion of their joints, if they load it very slowly, very light in a con in a, in a larger context of their training, I think that it's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think that it's something I would do heavy. I don't, I don't know that doing it heavy is necessary. Mm -hmm. I think if you do it and you train it and you have the capacity, like, is that really the way you want to build continue? Like, is that, Right. Cause it's like, I, you could put your shoulder in a weird position and like, get it to do certain things too. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, full, full flexion of your body is not a weird position. You know, it's mm -hmm. a very normal position, mm -hmm. but I think, I think my issue is that people were so focused on it mm -hmm. and, and their whole programming was like, not 
well made. It's like, why are mm-hmm. you focusing on the Jefferson curl when the fundamentals of your program aren't good? Yeah. Like you're not doing any locomotion training. You don't train your feet. You don't train mm-hmm. your calves and you're going to be so focused on doing Jefferson curls. You know, like there's so much emphasis on it. So I don't think there's anything that's good or bad. But yeah. if you did Jefferson curls three times a week and you were doing it like heavy, which I don't think that's how people are doing it. Mm-hmm. Some people are doing it. Some people are doing it in class, a class setting at 7 a.m. Mm. I, I, you know, is that really, what are you trying to do? Mm-hmm. Like, are you doing it for a reason or are you doing it because everybody's talking about it? Mm-hmm. Like you should know why you're doing something. And if you know why you're doing something, it's, you know, it's your right to do it. I don't know that I will be incorporating it, but I am doing a lot of unloaded lumbar flexion with straight legs and I Mm -hmm. am feeling really good and it has made my back feel better and my hips and everything. Um, I'm also not lifting heavy right now. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm doing very little weight training, like one day a week, two days a week, maybe. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing it. I'm like stretching those joints in the context of not lifting heavy, knowing my history of back stuff. Mm. So I'm being very delicate with it. Um, So it's just, it probably goes back to like what everybody says, where it's like, it just, everything's specific to like somebody's previous history of injury, what Mm -hmm. their goals are. Like if my goal is to be really healthy for as long as possible, Maybe, maybe doing it a little bit is good, Mm -hmm. but maybe I get what I need to get from it through my other exercises, through my other movements. I don't know. Like, I'm not sure what, like, am I just trying to hypertrophy my lumbar spine erectors? And then if that's the case, is that the Mm -hmm. best way to do it? If Mm -hmm. I just do, if I just do like trap bar deadlifts plus the static holds in yoga, do I get the same benefit? Mm. You know, is there some unique Mm -hmm benefit i get i don't know i guess maybe uh for stretching uh the posterior um fascia i guess uh to maximally stretch it with the added late added load yeah that would be so then my my, my question then would be like is that better or is just doing it with no weight sustained better Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah each person needs to experiment i mean that's part of like that's part of the enjoyment of training and training people and working with people is that you get to put your methods to the test, Mm -hmm. you know, in yourself and in other people. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to say that I think that it's bad. Yeah. I understand its purpose. I understand why people are doing it. And I hope the people who are doing it understand why they're doing it and, Mm -hmm. and that they're selecting people. Like if you're going to do it for people who have back pain, thinking that it's going to be the thing because everybody on the internet is talking about it. Mm. I don't know that that's a good reason to do it. No. So I would rather be a little bit more cautious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I that's my, (laughs) that's my updated answer. I think that's a very fair answer. Uh, It's definitely an exercise that gets uh, attention because you can, some people will load up the barbell with stacks of <laughs> weight plates and be doing it. And you're just like, oh my God, look at that. So it definitely is poppy, right? It's eye catching when you, when you see it. Well, there's a whole, and this is like kind of what I was saying about like, it's just, you know, is it just because it's this popular thing? Like mm-hmm. people, people's motives for posting on Instagram are not always like, you don't know who this person is that maybe they're just posting it because they, if they post something controversial, they get more likes and interaction. It makes mm. their page grow. And then it's like, mm. what the hell am I watching? I'm just watching somebody who's trying to get popular. So they feel good about themselves because they have low self-esteem. <laughs> is that where I'm going to get my training information from is someone who's an attention whore on Instagram because they need to feel good about themselves. <laughs> like, I mean, and it's sad that it's true that people are doing that. Maybe they don't know that they're doing that. I'm sure mm-hmm. there's people I'm sure there are tons of people who are doing it with good intentions also, Mm -hmm. but I think like, it's so easy for anybody to put anything on the internet that one must use discretion when choosing what to learn or from whom to learn. And just because we see something doesn't mean it's good. It could just mean that it's what the human eye is attracted to. And then Mm -hmm. we mistakenly interpret that as it must be effective because everybody's talking about it. Maybe everybody's talking about it because it's controversial and the people talking about it a lot of the time 
use controversy to become more popular to serve their own need and mm. desires. Mm-hmm. Not that it is the, you know, it's popular because it's the best tool because the best tools are usually boring. Mm-hmm. They're usually boring. They're not, you know, like they're the fundamentals. And then, you know, so that doesn't get as popular. People want to get, so there's like, you have to, you have to sift through the noise. Yeah. Now I bet I would, I would, I would bet that there are many people who've done Jefferson curls, who've gotten improvement and improved their quality of life. And I can never argue with practical uh, results. Mm -hmm. So I, and I'm sure that there are very talented people who use it. I know there are, because I know that some of these people Mm -hmm. who share it and they do it with the best of intentions. So I'm just saying for anybody listening just remember that people who make these things, you don't know what their motives for doing it are. You have to use your judgment and come to a, your own mm-hmm. conclusions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like uh, with what we were ta- saying about load and how load is a tool. Jefferson curl is an exercise. That's a particular tool and it yeah. might have a, the right context that it fits into for a particular sure. individual, but it's not like something that you needs to be prescribed straight across the board for everybody. It's probably not no, right. And I think everybody. that, I think that it was done initially um, for gymnasts who are doing a ton of extension work and they needed to strengthen equivalently into flexion, Mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense. Taking that and then applying it to someone who sits at a chair of their office eight hours a day. It's like, does that person need more flexion reps? Probably not. (laughs) Maybe they need more extension. Maybe they need more neutral. Maybe they need more side bending. So again, it's like, is it Mm -hmm. worth it for that person if, if somebody's problem is they're spending too much time in flexion, mm-hmm. I'm not sure that a flexion based loaded exercise is the best choice. Exactly. And I think that's, I think that's really where I'd be the most like mm, mm-hmm. probably better ways to spend this person's time. Mm-hmm. And then it gets back to being a, a healthcare professional. That's a bit of a detective and you're trying to figure out what exactly is happening in this person and his life. And then what can you contribute to it? to undo some of the repetitive motions they're doing and then also help strengthen some of their weak links. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe, maybe in 10 years, I'll be like, I'll only be doing Jefferson curls, you know, <laughs> and I'll be like, God damn it. I was wrong. I was wrong. And everybody else was right. And I should have been doing it. And you know what, if that's the case, I'll post, I will, I will happily admit that. I, like all my, all my points of view or whatever, like, all I want is to help people have the best experience in their own body as possible. Mm-hmm. Just use it, use it intelligently and be smart with what you're doing. Don't overdo mm-hmm. it and mm-hmm. try to look at the bigger picture of the quality of someone's life, which is mm-hmm. what you're really trying to help somebody with, unless you're a performance coach, obviously. Mm-hmm. Of course. Well, before we uh, end today's podcast, are there any questions you have for me? Maybe before we, uh, we go off, what do you think? Of the, what do you think of the, what, what is your train? I'm curious. What is your, how do you do, how do you train? What does your training look like for me or for other, my clients? No, for you, for you. How do you structure uh, yourself? What do you think about? I'm um, really heavily um, into flexibility training right now. Mm. I want to do, I want to be able to do the splits. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's ah. just like a, this visual thing that I've always loved ever since like I saw my first Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, probably. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I've always wanted to do that. So I'm focusing on that in terms of like um, training. Uh, but I guess uh, right now I'm doing a lot of jujitsu. That's my like newest passion. Uh-huh. So I've, I've, I've been doing that. Uh, ooh, going to a gym. So speaking of jujitsu and, and back pain, this, that's my newest source of back pain actually is doing jujitsu. turns out when mm. you grapple somebody, you're constantly flexing your back and exerting yourself quite intensely. And so, mm-hmm. uh, that's been my, uh, recent kind of uh, cause for back pain. I never really had any strong, uh, um, like episodes where like it's been a really bad back pain, but uh, I've, I've been noticing a lot of soreness post-workouts, post-trainings. So uh, it's a new stress. Mm-hmm, exactly. Something I'm completely not uh, used to and haven't had time to adapt to. Right. Yeah. Cool. Do you like it? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's uh, I did. I do have a golfer's elbow in my, <laughs> in ah. my uh, ever since starting it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, rehabbing that a little bit, but this is a, a whole back to, different. 
whole yeah. different world of training, I would imagine. I've never done it. Mm-hmm. But similar to kind of what we've been talking about where, you know, I've, I've been, I'm trying to pay attention to what signals my body's sending me. So the, this elbow thing, like um, it didn't even, I didn't even feel it when it happened. Oh, there wasn't, there must've been a momentary thing of pain. And then, but I didn't notice it at the time. And then after the training was over later on, when I was home, I felt a little bit of inflammation in the, in the joint. And then uh, the following days, it, it got, kind of got worse, but it's now it's been getting better with the rehab, but it just goes to show like it can, it can happen in a split second. You don't even know what happened. And then if you don't pay attention to it, it's going to get worse unless, and now I've been deloading. I've been, uh, um, mm-hmm making sure that I'm only doing things that I'm comfortable with and paying attention to what signals the elbow is sending me. So there's a lot of uh, parallels between low back pain and any sort of pain really you, you feel in any part yeah, of the body. Yeah, it's all tissues. I mean, there's nothing special about the low back. It's just mm-hmm. the most common area, mm-hmm. but it's the same underlying principle for any thing in a human body. The only mm-hmm. way to not have these problems is to not have a body. You know? <laughs> part of having... Part of having a body is learning how to, how to deal with it, you know, because mm-hmm. things like that will happen. It's, it's an important You'll lesson. Just, you, yeah. And you can't like, you got to use this thing. You got to mm-hmm. learn about it and stress it. And yeah. And then when you do new things, new things pop up and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's part yeah. of the experience though. You know, of like doing something new, being a beginner and like doing something you, I mean, I would imagine like if you've never done jujitsu, people can just manhandle you yep yeah yeah and it's just so humbling yeah <laughs> like in, in in yoga like i'm trying to do these like side bends and like i've done so many pull-ups that my like arm is so tight and i, I feel so <laughs> stupid i'm like oh i'm sure in, you know in jujitsu it's another level because you have to like tap out yeah 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 and then like there's a soreness in the low back in the neck too like all along the spine oh yeah so I've been like trying to do these neck sit-ups where I'm like lying off, off of the uh, couch, let my like neck kind of hang in the air. And I just do neck sit-ups to strengthen those muscles. <laughs> right. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like if you're doing Jefferson curls, cause you do jujitsu, not because you're, and you're not doing like tons of high intensity deadlifts and back squats and cleans and, mm-hmm. you know, sit-ups and everything. It's like, well, maybe if, you know, you're trying to condition it for these specific positions, you know, that could be a world in which it's extremely useful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I have no experience there. So I'm, I'm super ignorant about it. Me too. I'm just learning. I'm just trying to yeah. figure out what are like the key ah. things about this. And of course, like this is kind of like a lifelong pursuit. Like it's going to be years and years before I can graduate to even a blue belt, let alone black belt. So yeah. And you'll probably, you know, I think like over the years, you'll probably try other new things too. And it'll be a continual learning process as you continue building out your homunculus. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Anyways, thank you so much, Ryan. This has been an awesome conversation. And just before we go, maybe we could just let the listeners know about Movement Fix, the podcast and your tool, the Mm T-Tool. And then, Mm -hmm. yeah. So T-Tool is a, um, a business venture of mine that is an ergonomic soft tissue treatment tool designed for body workers. So um, I performed body work for, well, I had my clinic for eight years before I sold it. And then I started T-Tool, which is the first product in a business that I'm planning on making that serves the body workers, body working community to make great products to help them with their work. T-Tool is the first um, so it's really designed for that population. It's not really designed for, you know, people at home, although people buy it for home and use it, but it's certainly a professional product. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be found at the T, the letter T tool.com. And it's called T tool because it looks like a letter T. And, um, so that's primarily where I'm working right now is I'm focused on growing that. It's a totally, you know, it's like me playing jujitsu. I just keep getting beaten up and learning all these things. I don't understand. Yeah confronting my, you know, but it's, I'm learning a ton about how to run a different, totally different. I mean, a product-based business is a totally different type of business than running a clinic or workshops or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and then movement fix is, uh, I've been taking a break from that podcast for the last seven months. I do plan on starting it up next year Mm -hmm. and people can find that. Just go to, go to iTunes or Spotify type in movement fix podcast. Mm -hmm. I think there's like 150 something episodes. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, They're all good. I've listened to all, probably all of them. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, people can check that out there. I also have a ton of videos on YouTube. You know, it's funny is how many people listen to my podcast and don't realize that I have actually way more stuff on YouTube mm-hmm. than I do on the podcast. So if you go to YouTube and type in the movement fix, I have hundreds of videos mm-hmm. on just mm-hmm. basically what I did was anytime I had a patient interaction and I was like, Ooh, I should make a video about this. Cause I bet other people would learn from this interaction. I mm-hmm. made a video talking about those things. Mm-hmm. Movement so fix that's Mondays. what they, Movement fix Mondays. Yep. Fully inspired by my, by my patient and client interactions. So those are all, Amazing. that's where, that's where it all came from. And I just felt like if I'm seeing it, other people need, you know, if, if my perspective maybe can help them. So all those are there. Um, yeah, it's basically it. I'm going to start, I'm actually like planning on <clears throat> one of the things that I want to do is I want to build this T tool business because I have other products that I want to make build that to a point where I feel like I've really mastered running a business like that. And then what I want to teach is other health and fitness Mm. entrepreneurs, how to do it. Um, so Mm. I will be teaching that eventually on my website, which is Ryan Mm-hmm. It's like the most basic website on the internet because I'm not doing anything there right now. But if, mm-hmm. if people want to learn those types of things that I'll be teaching in the future, put your email there. Mm. Sometimes I do webinars and other mm-hmm. talks on business related topics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're really passionate about that. That's how you and I got connected. Yeah. Did you, you came to the, did you do the, yeah, you, you did the webinars, the healthcare the, professional webinars, the healthcare professional webinars. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I'm actually, because like, I think about like, how can I, like people gain their satisfaction. It's one of the, it's one of the ways this humans are structured is that we get our satisfaction when we help people and yep. when we help people more than the money that they pay us, which is the, the whole use value, cash value thing. Yeah. And so f- what I think about a lot is like, how do I help the most people? And one of the ways that I think I can help the most people is by helping um, the helpers help the helpers. helping the helpers in the business because a, I strongly believe that businesses are the things that help humans the most. Mm. And health and fitness entrepreneurs are people are like people that are trying to help people in a very meaningful, super loud motorcycle. Sorry, <laughs> are uh, are <clears throat> really helping people with things that I have experience with health and fitness related things. And so if I can help those people in their business world, then I think that has the largest possible effect. And so it's like where I feel like in the future, I can be the most useful, Mm. but I don't feel good about fully doing that until I've done it authentically myself, which is what I'm doing with this T tool business. Mm. Um, Because I've done digital products and, and, um, courses in a clinic, mm-hmm. um, which was part of what got me to this point where I, I feel like I can run a really interesting mm-hmm. e-commerce business here. So mm-hmm. I'm putting myself through the grinder to figure out how to make it, how to like, what are the fundamental things that, you know, make a business turn into a really great business. And then I'm going to, my goal is to do that operate it at a really high level. And then share with other people the things that I had to do to make that happen. It's like, that's my vision of what I'm trying to do. So the point, the point of me, very hard for me to come to that. Like a lot of struggle in internal stuff to get clarity on that vision. Mm -hmm. Like it took me until now to really feel like a solid vision of what I'm trying to do over the longer term. Um, which is, you know, as you went to my webinar thing, those are my pylons. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so anyways, that's what I'm trying to do moving into the future. But I, like I said, I have to be authentic. Otherwise I just cannot do it mm-hmm. because you can't live inauthentically. Mm-hmm. Like you can do it, but you'll suffer internally because you'll know, and then you can't sleep well. And then it leads to all sorts of problems. A lot um, of energy so that'll be, spent on that. Yeah. So that'll be at ryandbell.com is where I'll be sort of like centering that stuff Mm -hmm. into the future for anybody who wants to sign up for an, I don't even email that list Mm -hmm. people. It's just, that's where I'm going to do it in the future. So that's it. 
Awesome. All right. Well, longest, thanks. the longest ever <laughs> where to learn more section of a podcast right there. I think <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll edit it down. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ryan. This has been an awesome conversation and uh, yeah, I think just uh, awesome to be able to talk to you having listened to your podcast for, for such a long time. So J Mart, yeah. the pleasure is all mine. Great. Great. Thanks again for watching or listening till the end of the podcast. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, please reach out and let me clear up any uncertainty. Either leave a comment or send an email to newsletter at jmartfit.com. That's all I have for you today, ladies and gents. Connect with me on social media at jmartfit on Instagram and Twitter and jmartmoves on Facebook. Or get my free bodyweight training program through subscribepage.com slash bodybasics. Jmart out.